So this is uh, Sunday, July 26, St. Luke's Church in Anchorage. We're talking about pilgrimages. And we did, um, Peter, were you here two weeks ago when we started on the uh, uh, Camino de Santiago? Yes, it, it, I was. Yeah, okay. And uh, Judy wasn't here, no. Oh, my advance button's not working. Okay, there we go. So. There we go. So we started with uh, the Camino de Santiago. We didn't quite finish it. So just we'll just finish up on that and then we'll start talking about the Holy Land. Um, of course, just a brief run over on St. James, who was the son of Zebedee and Salome, the brother of John the Disciple. And I'm sure you all know, you both know the story. You know, he preached in the Iberian Peninsula, beheaded in 44 AD. Uh, when he returned to Jerusalem with three of his uh, converts from Spain, and they were all beheaded, but the King Herod would not allow them to be buried in Jerusalem. So his disciples smuggled the bodies out by boat back to Galicia. And of course, Galicia is this uh, northwestern section of Spain where he did a lot of his preaching and where he was then buried. After a couple centuries, his location of his tomb was lost. And there's a legend in 813 of a uh, farmer being out there and seeing a light in the forest and hearing music, and going to explore the area and rediscovering the tomb of St. James, which sounds, you know, on, on one level sounds a little bit fantastic. Is this really it or not? But, you know, they did some serious investigation to it. It was very much a um, old Roman style uh, tomb. Uh, it was a body in there that was beheaded. It was, and they came to the conclusion it was definitely St. James uh, tomb and King Alfonso of Galicia at the time ordered a chapel to be built there, which eventually became the cathedral that it is today. Um, interestingly enough, in 1879, there were some further ex ex excavations in the church and they discovered a second tomb attached with three other bodies which further confirmed that this is truly St. James because three of his colleagues went with him to Jerusalem and were also beheaded and also smuggled back to Spain. So if there was any doubt that it was St. James's tomb, uh, you know, uh, a thousand years later, they discovered the secondary tomb attached where his uh, companions were also buried. And there are several different Caminos you might take with this Camino Francis is the most popular. 60% um, of the um, of all of, all the participants in the Camino actually take that route. And considering there's there's four or five or six, depending on how you look at it, major routes. That that's a pretty significant majority. So when people you see pictures of the Camino de Santiago or hear about it, it's probably the Camino Francis, which starts here in Saint Jean Pied de Port and it's uh, 500 miles long. And, um, find the numbers on that. I've lost my, uh, hang on just a second here. Yeah, uh, 780 kilometers. I was trying to look that up. And so the, the um, Camino de Francis uh, traverses through wine country and uh, the Pyrenees Mountains and hits these major cities along the way. Oh, there we go, 790 kilometers long. Uh, most people take 30 to 30, 35 days and we're talking 30 to $60 per day. And we talked a little bit about some terminology. Comp Compostela is the pilgrim certificate you get at the end of the walk. Along the way, there's, there's places where you can stay, the albergues and refugios, uh, which are supported by local churches, mostly uh, civic organizations of the cities. And all this we talked about the last time we met. But here, here's some pictures along the way. St. Jean-Pied-de-Port, where you start out. Uh, and this is where you'll pick up your 
passport that you want to get stamps on along major pathways along the way. And then, you know, part of the pilgrimage, of course, is not just the destination, but what you see along the way. So I found some interesting facts and pictures about the cities you'll pass through. Uh, Pamplona. Uh, Pamplona is the capital of the Navarra region. This is the city that's world famous for the running of the bulls. And this is the Plaza de Castillo, that's the town center. And the locals also refer to it as El Cuarto de Estar, the uh, living room, they call it their living room. Population of Pamplona is about 200,000. And here's the cathedral, you wanna to go to the cathedral to get your stamp to prove that you've been to Pamplona on your certificate. Uh, they, they began a cathedral construction in the year 1000 that was Romanesque and later it was replaced by a Gothic cathedral which began building in 1394. So when you go to this cathedral you're going to something that's been there for a thousand years and for centuries it was the site of coronations and burials of kings of the king of this region you know, before Spain was unified and we had all the little kingdoms in Europe. King of Navarra, uh, his uh, weddings and marriages and burials and you know significant events would take place here at this cathedral. So a lot of history. It's the oldest music chapel in the area. They've had a musical institution there for 800 years. And then the next city you'll pass through will be Lagrono, which is the uh, wine country. Uh, it's the capital of the La, La Rioja wine region. Then you pass to Burgos, you see the Catedral de Santa Maria, which was began construction in 1221. It was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1984. Then you pass to Burgos, and then Leon. You see the Santa Maria de Leon Cathedral, also called the House of Light. Again, also built 13th century. And then Ponferrada. So this pilgrimage, of course, you know, it's fascinating to know the story of St. James and, and the ultimate destination, but boy, what a lot of beautiful things you see along the way. And a lot of history, a lot of ancient, you know, it's, it's, it's the journey, I think in any, Pilgrimage, it's the journey that's the important part, not the actual destination. And these are just pictures I gleaned from the internet of the walk along the way. And you see these, these symbols always mark the way, the seashell. Those will mark the way of St. James as you're going along. Oh, and there's, there's, the, there's the final destination cathedral, the uh, Cathedral Santiago de Compostela, Compostela's Field of Stars. Have you ever seen the movie, The Way? Do you know no. about the movie? <laughs> the Martin Machine? Yeah. No. I, it's, it's, it's a very heartwarming movie. It's, it's, um, I know it changed his life. Yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed the movie a great deal. It was it was bittersweet. It wasn't you know there's there's it wasn't an adventure. It wasn't a comedy. It was just a bittersweet, heartfelt movie. You know his character in the movie, his character's Martin Sheen's son died doing the Camino, and Martin Sheen's character ends up going out to complete complete it in honor of his son. And so, you know, he's dealing with a lot of issues along the way and meets people and it's, it's a really, it's really well, I think it's worth seeing. Written and directed by Emilio Estevez, who, who played, of course, you know, of course is his son and he played his son in the movie, but it didn't have much of a role because, you know, he was dead, <laughs> but you know, they had flashback scenes where he played his son. All right. So the Holy Land and, um, 
I'm sorry, Bud and Jennifer aren't here because, because I stole some of their pictures, but, but Judy, you're here. You are on that trip, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. So you can, you can fill us in on when I get to that part, uh, anything that you recognize. Peter, did you go on that trip with St. Luke's to the Holy Land? No, no, no. Well, I, I'm certainly no expert on the Holy Land, but I, uh, boy, I mean, there sure is a lot to see in a condensed little area. And of course, you know, it's the center focus of three major world religions, including ours. So there's, there's plenty of things to see and experience there. This is the wall around Jerusalem, which was built by Suleiman in the 16th century when when the, uh, when the Muslims took over Jerusalem for a few centuries. And then there, uh, so there are several gates around Jerusalem. And this is the Golden Gate. And it's been blocked off for several, it's the only gate that's blocked off. All the other gates are still functioning. The Golden Gate. Uh, the, the, the saying is, that this is the gate that Jesus will return on and that the Muslims have blocked it off to keep him from entering the city. Oh, is that the reason? Oh, okay. Well, you know. Yeah. That's what they say. <laughs> yeah. Right. Now, it's, it's interesting. I, I brought one of my books here. Uh, let me find the page. The, those two gates, uh, hang on, let me find it. Sure. Um, here we go. It's in the eastern wall, the door of mercy and the door of repentance. Oh, really? The door of repentance is on the right, and you go in there, and you receive your forgiveness, and you come out of the door of mercy. Oh, wow. So you, you go into the temple from there. Mm -hmm. these are, I don't know whether you can see them or not. These are pictures of the inside. Of oh. Those oh. Yeah. And then this is another gate. This is the Damascus gate, which oh. most yeah. of you, I don't know. Can you see? Yes. yes. Yeah. OK. That takes you into the marketplace. And the entrance of it, well, it's kind of dark there. The entrance of it, you go in, and then there's a sharp turn, and it's very narrow. And that was to keep marauders on horseback from entering. It was to slow down the entrance of the enemy so that they could defend it. Oh. <laughs> so there, that's, that's the gate. Continue. So you can you can actually walk through the Golden Gate, Judy? No, not through the Golden Gate. Oh, okay. Damascus Gate. But you yeah. can walk through the inside of it, yeah. When you once you're inside, you can see the workings of it. You can look down on the workings. But you said one is redemption, the other is mercy. Correct. But, but you can't now go in through redemption and come out through mercy. No. No, okay. No, but that's the same. In the mikvahs, you know, the ritual baths, they'll have a, a, a stairway down into the water and a stairway out of the water. And that's the same principle of going in unforgiven and coming out forgiven. Oh. Or guilty and not guilty or, you know, unblessed and blessed, whatever. Unclean and clean. So that's the same, same principle. Wow, really interesting. Yeah, very, very symbolic. That's really cool. Well, I have a feeling when Jesus comes back, those blocked doors won't stop him from going through. I don't think it will stop him. <laughs> the, the, the Muslims are right outside this gate. That's where their tombs are. Okay. And across the valley, the Kidron Valley, on the hillside are the Jews, and the Christians are down in the valley. <laughs> They're in between the Muslims and the Jews, which is, that's where their, 
their graves are, which is kind of symbolic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> This, this gate faces the um, Mount of Olives. Oh, does it? Yeah, it faces the Mount of Olives, Gethsemane. Just right across the valley from Gethsemane. Yeah, so there's, there's a total of eight gates. Yeah. And, um, the Golden Gate here, of course, is also known as the Gate of Mercy, the Eastern Gate, the Beautiful Gate. But all, all except this one are still in use. There's Zion. Zion Gate. The Arabic name for the gate of, for this gate is the prophet of David, the gate of the prophet of David, because the tomb of, tomb of King David is on the adjacent Mount Zion, just a few steps away. And this gate leads directly to the Armenian and Jewish quarters. And you, and, and, yeah. Like you were talking about the, where the, all the different people live, there's, there's four different quarters, the Muslim quarter, the Jewish, and the Christian, and the Armenian quarter, which I find really interesting since Armenians are Christians. You know, they were the first Christian nation in the world. And it's interesting to me they have their own quarter in Jerusalem. You know, the Armenian... People go back. They're indigenous people in the in the in the um, Turkish Peninsula, what is now Turkey. Uh, they are so ancient. We don't know. They're like basically the original people. They're like the Greeks. They're just they're so ancient as a society, as a culture. You don't even know when they started. You know, we're talking thousands, literally thousands of years. Um, so they were an indigenous people in this region of the world. Of course, I take it personally since my wife's Armenian by heritage, you know, but I just find it interesting they have their own quarter in Jerusalem. Uh, looking at this map in the Armenian quarter, the first picture that you showed was of David's Tower, uh -huh. which has nothing to do with King David. But anyway, and the citadel, um, King Harry just rebuilt it, and, and it was his palace. It, it, he left those towers. Anyway, in that general area, you go in the Jaffa Gate, David's Tower, just up the street from that, toward the Latin part, Patriarchate, is uh, the Anglican Church, <coughs> St. George's. Oh, really? Yeah. And that's where their uh, school of, of uh, Bible school. Anyway, a lot of a lot of clergy will go there and stay there and oh. attend that Bible college. Cool. I, I didn't and, know they had a church there. Yeah. Well, we've got two in Jerusalem. One is for the Christians and one is for the Jews. One is to convert to Jews. Oh, really? Yeah. When, Pat, when Arthur went for the first time, he stayed there at St. George's and uh, went down for breakfast one morning. And uh, by golly, there was a man he knew in Somerset. Now, we're in oh. West Virginia at that point. But uh, I think... He was at the Christian church there in Somerset. Anyway, he was working at, at the college, <laughs> St. George's mm. College. Another time he ran across somebody from Somerset in the Galilee at breakfast. Yeah. It, it, so it's interesting. So go ahead. Oh, yeah, that's really cool. So the, so the Dung Gate, did you see why you were there? Yeah. So that leads to the Western Wall and uh, the Temple area. Yeah. And it got that name because in the second century, it was the gate for removal of dung and trash, where they would burn they would burn the dung and the trash in the valley across the way, probably because of prevailing winds, keep the smell from going into the city. 
in the Damascus yeah. Gate. Yep. It's the beginning of the Damascus Road. And now it's the primary entrance to the Arab sector. Yeah, that's where the bazaar is. <coughs> you go through the markets. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And we stayed at the Olive Tree Hotel, which is about three blocks away from the Damascus Gate. So we could walk up from our hotel and go through the Damascus Gate and go through the markets. Mm. Which, by the way, is part of the Via Dolorosa to see the marketplace. Oh, really? Yeah, that would be something to see too. So the, the pillars under this gate date back to the time of Christ, which is pretty wild to think about. You know, walking through these doors that Jesus also walked through. And most likely Jesus went through this gate on the way to his death, like you said, the Via Della Rosa, so that would make sense. Not this, not from this angle, no. No, he right. Bumped to the sheep gate, probably. And it's uh, grandiose because it was designed for dignitary entrance. Did you go to the Mount of Olives when you were there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's just right across. This is, the Mary Magdalene. This is the Church of Mary Magdalene and oh, yeah. Sisters of Mary Magdalene are there. And that's the Dome of the Rock. And down here are the graves. And over here to the right is the beautiful gate. Right there. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I can see it. I didn't notice that before. And then the Dome of the Rock over here. Yeah. yeah. So you can see people would go in and to the temple. They would be going through this gate to go to the temple. And then they would come back out the Gate of Mercy. Yeah. In the, the Garden of Gethsemane is at the foot of the Mountain of Olives, right? No, the garden is up here. It's, it's up higher than what you're seeing here. Oh, okay. Okay. But this is a view from the Mount of Olives looking at uh, Jerusalem. Right. And that's the garden. Yeah, it's pretty. With the old, old olive trees. Yeah. yeah, right. Of course, where Jesus prayed on the night of his betrayal. It's a 12 square yeah. meter area. I would say it says near the foot. It's about halfway down from the top, from the top okay. of the mountain. Yeah. The name Geth Gethsemane is Hebrew for oil press. Which of course makes sense since, like I said, there's all those olive trees there. I'm going to love you and leave you because I'm going to go and check in. Okay, the Peter. Nice to see you. We'll, we'll finish this off next week then. Bye, Peter. Bye. See you Wednesday. Talk, yeah, I'll talk to you before then. Okay. I know. I've been reading emails. <laughs> In the mountain side. That's, yeah. That's, um, oh gosh, that's the Domitian, I believe. Yeah, I think it is, yeah. Yeah, Church of the Domitian. Right. And the mountain Zion is where the Last Supper was. Yeah, it's there. And the King of David. Oh, King it, of, the, the Tomb of David uh, tomb. is, is they, there's a building there, and the upper room is the upper room. Okay. Uh, really? The last okay. Supper is. But below it is the tomb of David. It's not really, but that's where the Jews go and pray. Uh, <coughs> for the tomb of David. Yeah. Where uh, Jesus <laughs> appeared before the high priest Caiaphas. Yeah. And like I said, the, the Dormition of Mary, the falling asleep of the Virgin Mary. Right. 
It's also the site of the Council of Jerusalem in AD 50, which is mentioned in the book of Acts, where they debated the status of converted Gentiles. Um, the uh, Church of uh, the Rooster Crows, Delicantu, is, it, you can't see it here, but that's actually where Jesus appeared before the priest, Caiaphas. I'll have more pictures next time. Yeah, yeah. And you're seeing over here on the right, the uh -huh. apex of the Temple Mount. Of course, the real top of the temple that that Jesus was taken during the temptation is probably underground. But oh, okay. There you can you can you know, but right there on your right, that's the walls around the this area here temple. Mm -hmm. Wow. What a lot of history. Yeah. A lot to see, but you know, and I'll say this next time too, if there's more people there. Um, pilgrimages, <laughs> when you're here, there's so much history and so much to see. Um, you're, you're mostly a tourist. Sure. But have, you, have you talked about thin places? Oh, well, I, I, I did talk a lot about thin places when I did a talk on Celtic Christianity. Yeah, there are so many thin places in Jerusalem. I'm sure there has in to Jerusalem, be. In Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, and yeah. on the Galilee. So, and it's different for everybody. It's, it's a personal pilgrimage because you will encounter, most unexpectedly, a sense of Jesus in those thin places. Right. At one time or another, you can't, and, and sometimes it's more than many, it's many times during the course of your visit there. Uh, but it's so intense and overwhelming that you can immediately become a tourist again. Right. You know, it's, uh, to me, that that's the pilgrimage, is, you know, you're walking along, you're a tourist, but boom, you encounter right. Jesus. And, and you never know when, but it's, it's really a very personal experience. I, yeah, I would imagine there's a lot of thin places there. A lot of those experiences would be pretty hard not to. Right. You know, I mean, this is where Jesus walked and lived and did his ministry. And you've got 2,000 years of religion happening there. People going there for a holy visit in not just Christianity, but the Muslims and the Jews. And, you know, more than 2,000 years of significant religious events happening there so right it's it's pretty phenomenal it's a holy place it truly yep. is and i will never forget attending a lecture given by one of the jewish scholars who said you know uh jerusalem is god's city and until the world realizes it's God's city. There's always going to be uh, unrest. Yeah, right. It doesn't belong to anyone, any one nation, any one uh, ethnicity, n nobody. It, it's God's city. Right. And there was a reason that David built it there because it was the only place was not owned by one of the tribes. Oh, really? Okay. Interesting. It was a neutral area. I'm going to stop the recording since it's 10 o'clock. And like you said, we're going to finish next week. Um, okay. I, um, 